Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Soul of Business with Blaine Bartlett. <clears throat> Excuse me. I am your host, Blaine Bartlett. And, um, you know, folks, today we've got a, uh, first of all, uh, I just want to acknowledge Nitin, uh, Nitin Ray as uh, my guest today, but I want to acknowledge him for this. He's a, um, a compatriot of sorts. Uh, or, you know, he's in, in Portland, Oregon right now. Uh, the University of Oregon is uh, my alma mater. And, uh, you know, a lot of the work that Nitin has been doing with his uh, with his organization, Elevate Capital, originally was rooted in the Oregon you know, geographic area. But uh, I, I wanted to acknowledge my home base, so to speak, if you will. Uh, I've got a strong affinity uh, to Oregon, to the Oregon Ducks, uh, and uh, all of the things that are kind of associated with that. Uh, I was a gymnast uh, at the university and. Uh, so wow. I have some very fond memories of my time there, and uh, go Ducks. So I'm just going to put that in. <laughs> yeah, selfishly, that has nothing to do with the uh, the, the the podcast, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to kind of highlight that for myself. Uh, so, <clears throat> like I mentioned, Nitin Rife is uh, who I'm speaking to uh, today, and who my guest is today. Uh, Nitin's the founder and managing partner of, a, of an organization called Elevate Capital, and Elevate was launched in, in 2016, and it's one of the very first uh, institutional inclusive venture funds in the U.S., and there's basically three funds that we'll be talking about here, but the reason I wanted to have him on, and this has to do with the soul of business and how business is actually one of the, if not the most transformative entity on the planet today if businesses can be run uh, yeah, in, a, in a very specific sort of a way. And that has to do with inclusion. It has to do with diversity. I mean, all of these sorts of things. And Elevate Capital has invested over $45 million in 58 startups, 95% of which are led by diverse founders. So, I mean, we've got a target-rich environment here that we can uh, kind of explore. And... Um, yeah, you know, just first of all, I want to just say, yeah, Nitin, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to join. Yeah, it's absolutely my pleasure to have you here. I've I've, I've enjoyed our previous conversations, and I'm very much looking forward to this one. Um, when you hear the term "the soul of business," what does that bring up for you? Well, it brings up your culture, your values, and how you're impacting your constituents. Uh, which is, includes your customers, uh, it includes your employees, and the society at large. So uh, that, to me, is the soul of the business. And, of course, at the end of the day, it's about making money, you know? So <clears throat> wealth creation is an important aspect of it because without that, then there's no business. There's no business, uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and I want to just you know, really emphasize that point. Yeah, anything that we talk about, anything that I actually posit around compassionate capitalism, which is kind of my uh, uh, standard, uh, you, know, that I, you know, the standard that I bear, uh, uh, it's not about not making money. Yeah, you know, it's about how does the business operate, you know, uh, and does it mm -hmm. operate in a fashion that actually you know, enlivens those with whom it comes in contact with? Yeah, you know, moving from surviving to thriving uh, would be probably the most colloquial and simplest way of describing that. Um, now you, you know, you're an entrepreneur. I mean, you, you know, Elevate Capital is just one of the number of things that you've done here. But you know, back in '94, you, you know, one of your first uh, organizations, mm -hmm. and you were an engineer at uh, uh, Silicon Valley. But one of your first organizations that you founded was First Insight Corporation, which is an electronic health records organization. And I'm just yes. marking that out here because in the in the uh, gestation between that founding experience and the funding experience that you're now heading up, how has the soul of business informed, if, if I can use that phrasing, but how has that informed your journey? And how does that journey then translate into how you vet the companies that you're actually working mm -hmm. with at Elevate? Well, so uh, every aspect of what I did at First Insight is come in play in my my journey as an investor. You know, so 
uh, when I started for Sinside, I had no money. Uh, I <laughs> I got to a point, actually, I was in Seattle uh, working for a startup, and I realized I couldn't work for anybody uh, because I kept butting heads on all kinds of things and the glass ceiling and all that, all of that stuff. So I realized that the only way, my only way out is to create my own table. And, uh, and the only way out is to just take the risk and uh, quit my job, which I did. <laughs> and um, and came back to Portland because you know this is where my network was, and I was comfortable here. I could have gone to Silicon Valley. I had many options to go to Silicon Valley, but I just came back because I had a network here, and a source of self-generated capital. So I self-capitalized the business. I didn't even know what I was going to do. Um, I just started a company, and it was actually called Guru Inc. first, and then uh -huh. changed to First Insight. Oh, I didn't know that. And, okay. Uh, yeah, so yeah, most people don't know about it. And uh, anyway, I mean, I ran into this idea uh, of First Insight because I went in for my eye exam and my eye doctor in Portland, in two years I hadn't seen him, had actually built a kind of a prototypish application that he was using chair side in the exam room. As, as a matter of fact, when I walked in, I filled out nothing. It was all on a computer. And being the really? nerd in I am. And in also, in 1994, it's very revolutionary back then. My gosh. Yeah. yeah. And some friends of mine were doing something similar with internists in another company in Portland called Medical Logic. So I had some familiarity with that. So I saw that and I'm like, I saw the light. You know, I'm like, this is what I want to do. I mean, I had like a bazillion ideas and then I would just honed in on that. And um, I bought the rights from him, uh, paid $3,000 and sold it the next day to his best friend. Uh, or actually, I. Yeah, it's, there was just basically the money I got from his friend, I gave it to him and I bought the rights to what he had done, which wasn't really, it wasn't really a full-blown product. And then I just <clears throat> self-funded for two years. I was consulting on the side and, uh, you know, ate Taco Bell every night, slept on the floor in a rented uh, room in the basement of a house, had owned a house, which was rented out. So I just sort of lived this sort of life of poverty, so to speak. Uh, but essentially spending every dime I was earning as a consultant, I made a quarter million that year. And I put it back in the business because I just believed in this future of electronic uh, health records. Um, and, um, you know, learned, learned some hard lessons. And, but the one lesson that I learned was cash flow positive, the becoming cash flow positive. And I think that kind of helped me uh, Talking about the soul of the business, so the, the one of the things I learned, and I actually hired a, a business coach who was amazing. What I learned was that that sales is the blood of the company, marketing is the brains, and yeah. those two things I knew nothing about. I knew everything about customer delight and customer satisfaction because I was part of my consulting was working with a lot of customers for the company I used to work for, so I knew that that was important. But these two things I'd never done, and so I had to learn it. And I learned about cash flow, and I still use the same cash flow statement that I used with my consultant Jill. So uh -huh. those those lessons, and then of course you know the fundraising happened, and it was hard. Um, I did eventually raise money from VCs. That was not easy, uh, uh, but I did. And then we were going to go public during the dot com boom. <laughs> and the markets crash. So timing, that was timing, another timing. lesson I learned. Well, <laughs> timing is everything. And, you know, a lot of venture capital, just because you raise a bunch of money, that doesn't mean anything, you know? Um, so, um, yeah, many hard lessons. The dream was IPO. That never happened. And then I fell back to the same, you know, mode of like, oh, I got to become cash flow positive. And then I eventually bought my investors out and swore I would never raise money again. So all those learnings, that experience, then translated into angel investing in Oregon. And I helped start an organization called Thai, which is a nonprofit that mentors entrepreneurs. And then eventually, you know, I was one of the early ones to start doing angel investing as a group. And all of those lessons and all of those learnings uh, came in play in terms of investing in entrepreneurs um, who need not just the money, but also the advice and, mm -hmm. and the guidance. And, yeah. and so that, that's what we call mentor capital. So long answer to your question was, yes, 
the soul of the to all these things I learned, you know, I've been able to share and and uh, and help uh, many many entrepreneurs um, over the last many years. Uh, I made about seventeen to twenty angel investments. I got many exits. Many entrepreneurs that I invested in have become millionaires and financial financially independent. So the generational wealth creation part was 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 you know very germane to it. And then the idea of give back and paying it forward um, mm-hmm. as well. So, okay. And that yeah. has all amalgamated into elevate to elevate those who don't have access. Because I, you know, back in those days, Indians were good engineers. You know, they weren't necessarily CEOs or you know that that didn't exist. You know, and 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 so uh, you know, I faced my own challenges on on funding as well. You know. That whole funding question, um, and, and this is one of the things that I'm intrigued with here is you know, just the diversity uh, of your uh, client, and I'll use client portfolio here, but the, the companies mm-hmm. that are in the portfolio, the diversity that's involved here, uh, 50% African-American, yes. majority of which are women, 67% founders of color, 10% LBG or LGBTQ, 10% veterans, 5% Latina. I mean, you know, these are, I mean, you've got a, you know, this is truly a rainbow uh, in one sense. Totally. Yeah. And, and, and typically, and I'm going to be very generalized here, and I recognize that, and I don't want to stereotype here, but generally, um, these are folks that tend to be disadvantaged in terms of their access to funding. And I've yes. got to ask this question, and in terms of how you go about making sure they don't get too much money. Yeah, in order to actually keep them moving, because in my experience uh, from an investing perspective, too much money is almost almost worse than having not enough. Oh, I agree with you. I had that. I raised twenty million in about a year and a half, uh-huh. and then I was told to spend it. You know, spend, spend, spend. Don't worry about dilution. Absolutely, and I would say that you know, in these last few years that I've been doing investments, I would say majority of our deals have not raised enough money, you know, because mm-hmm. the challenges are always there. And we've also had situations where there was too much money, uh, especially the last two, three years, there was a lot of dry powder, especially post COVID during yeah. the COVID period. A lot of companies got raised a lot of money and then spent it all. Right. So, um, you know, as early stage investors they, you know, there's up to a certain point that we can support them. But the moment they start bringing the, the later stage investors, you know, in the B rounds, a post A rounds, then those guys come in and they take control, right? They control yeah. in the sense they they start advising, and at that point, you know, we can, you know, there's only so much we can do, um, uh, with that respect. But in general, I can tell you that these entrepreneurs that we've invested in, most of them are, you know, they're very stingy is not the right word, but they're very financially astute that, and that's so a, that's a great description and and, and then the, because they're scrappy and by the way the one statistic that you didn't quote was 62 thirds of our investments are in women founders women don't splurge that's <laughs> they're true very careful with their money okay they come in more prepared right they know the value of the dollar all right they know how to spend it wisely and so it's the bro club that ends up spending. Just FYI, uh-huh. um, the 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 women founders are very smart, and I, they're much smarter than the guys. I, I I will admit, much much smarter, and they they tend to not fail so easily as the, the men do. And you know, and people say, "Oh, we celebrate failure." I'm like, failure is not an option <laughs> for us. <laughs> you gotta succeed, you know, because you fail. You're gonna say, "Oh, yeah, I'm not gonna invest in you," because of course, this is why you don't get money because you fail often, right? Yeah. So uh, I would say that is a problem. By the way, it is a problem when there's too much money that comes at people, and then you've got an investor class or VCs that get on your board and say, "Spend, spend, spend," because you know, grow at all costs. But that's, this is the bubble mentality, right? Yeah. And it's happened in like, I've seen three bubbles, you know, in my lifetime, uh, perhaps even fourth, like 1987, I started my career and literally within six months, 
there was the market crashed and oh the startup yeah. I was with was going to go public, didn't go public. So I've seen that happen. And, uh, and so my advice to founders has always been, you know, raise, if you, if you be able to raise more money, raise it, but spend wisely and sock some away for the rainy day, you mm-hmm. know? So, but I would agree with you that in general, you know, overcapitalization uh, is very problematic uh, because an, most of these, you know, I mean, venture capital is a very essential part of the success of the startup economy. But a lot of the VCs, um, they themselves are not founders, by the way. They're financial engineers. Yeah. And they are lemmings. <laughs> mm-hmm. and so, you know, uh, everybody follows everybody else. And so everybody is spending the money. It's like sort of the Wall Street, you know, has infiltrated venture capital for a long time. It's especially from from the dot com days. Yeah. And and so I think I think and and especially first time founders get caught up in this and they think it's you know they celebrate fundraising and which is really <laughs> I advise people not to celebrate fundraising. You know you celebrate when you build revenue and get customers and and then get a get a liquidity event and then you celebrate yeah i mean it kind of goes back to you know sales are the blood of the organization and the marketing becomes the brain yeah you, know, you need to have a, 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 a yeah. wireframe that can support all of that which is where the funding comes in yeah but of yeah. course you need to have a good product that's actually solving a customer problem so you know yeah. that piece is also important yeah that so you know <clears throat> this the the mentor capital idea um, I want to yeah. you know, kind of unbundle that a little bit because I think you know, that this is one of the first things that I was intrigued with around the whole you know, way that Elevate is actually working with, with their you know, uh, portfolio, you know, with you know, these business owners, you know, these founders. Mm-hmm. What, if, if there's any particular single uh, common denominator from a mentoring perspective, What's the one thing that you think these founders have in common that that uh, mentoring is actually addressing with them? Well, first of all, they're all very gritty. I mean, if 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 you're really looking at a common thread, the ones that we invest in are they have a grit level that you don't see, and we have a good way of identifying it. Partly because we're you know I'm a, a founder, you know, so we we tend to just grasp that piece of it. The second piece in common is transparency. So they are very open to feedback because if they're not transparent, they're not going to take your advice, right? Um, and and that means that when things are going wrong, they're going to come tell you, right? Uh-huh. Sooner than later, right? And the transparency and the ability to listen, I mean, obviously they got to make their own decision. But yeah. being open to feedback, being open to taking feedback in a constructive way and and then t- t- executing on it, maybe not exactly the way that you're telling them to do, but but they take the feedback and they execute. And this seems to be a common thread in entrepreneurs that we've invested in that have had great success. And great success to us is at some point they've been able to sell their business do something to get liquidity for themselves and to their shareholders. Mm -hmm. That seems to be the common threat. And they are very effective leaders. They know how to inspire people, inspire people to come in the business. Uh, They have a charisma, they're charismatic. um, But at the end of the day, transparency matters because they don't know what they don't know. And the ones that recognize that they don't know everything Right. And uh-huh. they also know how to deflect noise. You know, we have entrepreneurs who fail because they just got a weak ear. They're just listening mm-hmm. to way too many people and then end up just not executing because they got too many voices in their ear. So being able to discern, you know, whose feedback to take and who's not to take uh, mm-hmm. is also important. You know, that's, I want, I want to come back to that point here, uh, particularly with VC. Mm-hmm positions on a board because you mentioned uh typically a vc Mm -hmm. is not a has not had a founder experience but they also have an agenda so we're going to take Mm -hmm. a real quick break when we come back from this break i want to talk about 
um, <clears> that, that's yeah, kind of rock on a hard spot that a founder can find themselves in when the, mm -hmm. when they now have a board that is populated by folks that are not invested in the mission of the business as much as the business of the business. Okay. Right. So we'll sure. be right back, folks, uh, right after this short break. The nature of life is evidenced in nature. Nature grows, and all of nature honors the desire to be more, to have more, and to do more. Life thrives when it's allowed to grow. And ideally, thriving is what we also, all of us, want to be able to do. Unfortunately, at some stage in life, most people find themselves settling into what I can only call a rut. And a rut is nothing more than a coffin with the ends kicked out. You want to quickly get out of any rut that you find yourself in. When you stop growing, that's when the coffin starts to appear. You know, the simple truth is this, and this is true for everything in nature. You're going to die. I'm going to die. Every one of us dies. So the question we need to come to grips with is not are we going to die. The question nature asks us to answer is are we truly living? That's what motivation is about. It's the desire to move. It's the desire to grow and to excel. Have I lived? How have I lived? I'd love for you to take advantage of my Leadership Mindset Masterclass. It's all about providing you with the tools to ensure thriving for yourself and for those around you. Register today to receive the free introduction video and find out more about this acclaimed program. You'll also receive a copy of my international number one bestseller, Compassionate Capitalism, A Journey to the Soul of Business. I'm Blaine Bartlett and I look forward to helping you thrive. Hey, welcome back, folks. Uh, I hope you um, actually took something away from that little interlude uh, in between when we took our break and when we're coming back here. That master class that um, we uh, were referencing uh, in that little you know, commercial vignette, I want you to really think about taking a look at that because it's not just something that uh, you can... Uh, um, hear something about and if you're intrigued with it i want you to actually do something with your intrigue so this is just kind of my little add-on to what we were just listening to and uh Nitin, you didn't hear that you'll hear it when we edit and uh the the event goes or the episode goes live here uh but before we took the break um this idea of of, of uh, venture capital uh coming back into play here um we yeah, in my experience, and I'll just talk about my experience here. I won't put you on the hook for this, but my experience with many of the VCs that I've interacted with is they've got an agenda typically, and that agenda obviously is going to be a return on their you know, investment. But that return on the investment can op you know, oftentimes compromise the effectiveness of the founder and the founder's executive team, leadership team, to run the business in the way that it needs to be run to generate what the outcome is that everybody's seeking. Um, how do you, you know, I mean, and, and, and you're, you're going to have VCs on the board. There's no question about that. And mm -hmm. when you get to certain stages in most organizations or most, you know, most founding organizations here, what have you found that works to just kind of serve as a buffer, if you will, that can kind of keep everybody focused on the, uh, the, the, the for the sake of what that we're in this together so that you've got a common page for people to organize around. Is there any one thing or maybe two things that you've identified that seems to work better than not in keeping people focused? I think, I think you know, so what, once you're taking venture capital, and now I'm talking about, okay, larger institutional money, um, yeah. not necessarily neo, sort of nano VC or the really angel funds calling themselves venture funds. Um, I think once you take money from a proper institutional uh, funder, uh, let's say Series A, one thing that I recommend people is that make sure that your board has people who are founders, yeah. former founders, <clears throat> that they have that background uh, that can bring that wisdom uh, into uh, at the board level. Because, um, and, and, you know, again, it, a lot of it depends on, you know, do they have majority? Do they not have majority? But irrespective, once you get a VC on the board, at some point, they're going to start telling you what to do. Yeah. Um, 
in in a variety of different ways. And and obviously, you know, they're beholden by their LPs to to get a return. I think a lot of VCs, and again, I you know, I don't mean to generalize to every VC, but at least you know, I've been I'm on many many boards, and I see many many folks uh, in different sh- shades of gray. Some are really smart and astute, and perhaps has have some operating experience, or or they have the the mindfulness to bring people in with some operating experience that can help. Uh, but largely, um, you know, um, a lot of VCs, you know, kind of follow, like use the word lemming, um, they kind of follow what everybody else is doing. And, you know, in the times when there's a bubble economy, then it's like, okay, we just gave you $10 million. You should spend it, you know, <laughs> build an, a, a, a management team. Like, you know, typical, I mean, these are things that they told me, you need to bring, build a management team, you know? And it's like, okay, I will build a management team, but then what is this management team going to do, you know? Uh, Or, you know, just sometimes they just don't think about the stage that the company is. And again, I'm just in the early stage realm. That's what I know. I'm not in the, I'm not a growth stage guy. Um, And, and so what ends up happening is that there, there's a disconnect. So you've Mm -hmm. got a founder, especially a founder CEO, who's a first time founder CEO, who's trying to build a business is, is looking for help is, and then looks at some of these folks for help and they've never built a business before, but then they're giving them advice, which perhaps sometimes is, is really not conducive to mm-hmm. what the situation might be. You know? Yeah. I mean, I, I was on in one company where this person keeps talking about this cockpit control. And I, I'm just, I'm an observer. I'm not a board member. Now I'm on the board of this company. And I'm thinking like, what kind of useless stuff is this? You know, like, what is this cockpit control? Like, I don't need a cockpit control. I yeah. need sales. I need to get the product done. I need to make sure that, you know, what, what is it going to take to sell the product, right? What are the challenges in the product development? How do I build market share? You know, mm-hmm. how do I overcome those hurdles? You know, those, how do I fight competition? How do I differentiate myself? It has nothing to do with the cockpit control and yeah. managing some dashboard. And it's like every board meeting, it's about the cockpit control. Just one small example of it. Yeah. I, I mean, I myself was told, don't worry about dilution. You know, spend, spend, spend. You know, you know don't better to have a small dilution? piece of... Really? But then a, then a big piece of nothing. I mean, that was... Very critical advice because they're trying yeah. to push me to do an IPO. And so, uh, you know, just a couple of examples here that, you know, that where I think sometimes, um, or in one case, I remember one of the VCs saying, oh, we're looking to build a billion dollar company. They hired the wrong CEO. <laughs> the yep. wrong CEO, you know, uh, or deflect an offer for purchase um, because they think in two years, this company could be worth four times as much. And somebody had a boatload of cash to buy the business and gave the wrong advice to the CEO. My advice was sell the business. You know, when there's money yeah. on the table, you take it. You money, so that, yeah. there's just a few examples of, of where, you know, uh, where even seasoned VCs uh, tend to miss the boat because somehow they think there's this big pot Hang of gold on. there. Yeah, big pot of gold on the other yeah. side, and 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 that's the point I wanted to get to. It was the it's a mismatch in priorities, and this kind of goes back to the soul yes. of the business. Why are we in business to begin with? What are we trying to bring to market in terms of the experience, yeah. in terms of mm-hmm. uh, you know the difference that our product or service makes? Can we get that to market as effectively and as elegantly mm-hmm. as we possibly can? Uh, but right. if the focus is on the pot of gold, the imagined pot yeah. of gold. You've got right. all of a sudden scattered energies. You, you know, and this is where you yeah. talk about, you know, the founder CEO being able to tune out. You know, you got to have a strong yeah. ear. You know, who do I yeah, listen exactly. to? What do I listen to? And how do I discriminate about what information, yeah. what data is is relevant to where we need <clears throat> to be in our growth cycle right now? Yeah, mm-hmm. a cockpit in, in, in an early stage company mean, is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and that's where I think mentor capital uh, comes into play, where you have people that are looking from the founder perspective, not necessarily. And VCs that look from the founder's perspective, I think are far more effective than VCs that don't, you know. 
Yep. And so we as a fund are look always looking from the founder's perspective. Obviously, we care about returns. We care about uh, all of that. But we are always thinking about from the founder's perspective on what is what is the best for the founder, because if the founder succeeds, then we succeed. If they fail, we fail. Yeah. Um, and I don't know. I don't know if every VC thinks that they might they might verbalize it that way. But in terms of execution, they may not always necessarily act that way. Exactly. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of ego it. capital that goes. In. There's a, there's something called ego capital. Ego also. capital. Yeah. Now, I've and heard you talk about that before. A mock in the VC world. A mock. Just FYI. Ego capital. Just yeah. <laughs> Look how much money I got. I'll wave it around. Yeah. 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 I run a billion dollar fund. I know more than you do. You know. <laughs> yeah, because my number says so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my number says so. Yeah. 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 Uh, one last question here um, before we kind of begin to wrap this. Unfortunately, uh, yeah, the um, I'm going to come back all the way to you know this notion of transparency as a leader, as a founder, yeah, as a leader, as a founder. Yeah, the the common mm -hmm. thread that you said that was you know, kind of present in the ones that were you know seemingly more often successful than not was a high degree of transparency. Mm -hmm. And can you talk a little mm -hmm. bit about uh, for the listeners here? how that transparency shows up as a leader and what's the impact on the quote unquote followers as a consequence of them being, because transparency is scary, you know, or it can yes. be, I, I should say it can be because it, 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 you know, you have to be vulnerable in order to yes. be transparent. So how do you, how do you square that circle? Okay, so so transparency is in many different dimensions, right? There's yeah. transparency to customers, transparency to employees, and transparency of board and your investors. So I was talking in the context of mentor capital and mentoring and use your board member investor. I think, um, it, you know, from that perspective, I'm, I don't need to know every single detail, but mm -hmm. the 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 most important place where you need to be transparent is where you can see something's going to not go in the right direction. And if you're getting early signals of it, it's better to just call up your board members and say, hey, I'm not feeling good about this, or I'm not feeling good about this employee or this executive, or I see my sales pipeline not growing the way I thought I was going, it was going to grow. Um, it's it's and, and, you know, most founders know when something is going wrong, we all know something is going wrong. It's like yeah. well, the moment you get that feeling uh, or something is turning the wrong way to to let us know and and let us know and then ask for help. Say, can you help me? Right. Yeah. And if I can't help you, maybe I can. Help, or can you help me find somebody who can help me? But it's that kind of engagement, I think, is and it's it's I call it leaning in. So mm -hmm. it, it means that you don't wait till the last minute. You just alert, you pick up the phone and you call. That sort of stuff, and that actually builds a trusting relationship. Um, you know, so that's what I'm talking about, transparency. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is mostly in moments of uh, trials and tribulations is, uh, is to inform your investors or your board members or your mentors ahead of time and saying, hey, I don't think this is going to go well. Um, how can we, how can we fix it? You know, can, can you help me? You know, yeah. yeah. How can we fix it? <clears throat> and then also to the employees too, right? Employees also, you know, you want to, you want to be transparent to the employees uh, of what is going on. Obviously, to, to not every little detail, but, you know, if you can engage employees in moments of strife, you have no idea how much they'll step up and support you. We had one company where they got sued. They were raising some money that got off frozen and our advice to the founder was let the employees know hey we gotta all take a 50 percent haircut and you know what every one of them stepped up and yeah. took a 50 percent haircut for two months and then yeah. two years later the company sold and everybody made a bunch of money so i think uh i think employee transparency is also critical in, you know one of the interesting things about the that yeah that uh and I'm, I'm glad you raised that point because the the founder is seen as the leader in the organization yeah. but what oftentimes gets no. missed are that the followers are also leaders 
The followers oh, are, absolutely. You know, they have an incredible amount of power in the organization to have the organization no. be successful. And it's yeah, any leader, no. form, formal leader that isn't willing to ask for help shortchanges the opportunity that the followers have to lead effectively towards mm -hmm. that quote unquote promised land. And if, if, if we can no. begin to think of everybody in the organization as being leaders in an appropriate way, we start no. to have some very interesting synergies getting developed. Uh, Absolutely. And your example of everybody you know, kind of saying, okay, I'm in, I'll take a 50% haircut right now because mm -hmm. I, I'm still connected to the idea and the ideal yes. that got us here yes. to begin with. And I'm no. willing to take a haircut. I'll lead by example. Yes. That sort of a thing. I, I call it employee empowerment. You know, exactly. uh, when you empower your employees, uh, you know, they tend to outperform. Uh, it builds the loyalty, and uh, you know, I talk about, and this a lot of this is uh, happening at my company, First Insight, right now, because we're in our thirtieth year of business, and I have employees who've been twenty five plus years, um, highly loyal, um, and you know, the two two measures of success are customer loyalty and employee loyalty for a business to be long term. Yep. So while we think short term in liquidity for us as a fund. I'm always thinking about long term, like where could this business go in 10 years, 15 years? That longevity is um, is also important in terms of generational wealth creation. Yeah, that's great. You know, we're coming up on our 40th uh, anniversary. And yeah. Uh, well, congratulations. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a couple of years down the road here. We're at, I think, 40, no. 48 now, but or 38 no. right now. But, but the, the point about <laughs> customer loyalty and uh, mm -hmm. employee loyalty, our ten, the mm -hmm. average tenure of our client base is about 10 years. And I've got one client that's been yeah. with me for 34 years and right. been with us uh, as an organization. I mean, it's just, uh, I love I love this stuff and it's all relationship. So yeah. folks, my very first customer that gave me $3,000 for the product is still a customer. Whoa. Hey, fist bump. <laughs> I love season. that. I love it. That's very cool. Folks, we've been listening to Knit and Rye. Uh, the founder and managing partner of Elevate Capital. Uh, Nitin, where can people find out about uh, the work that you're doing with Elevate and also about the work that you're just doing personally? So you can uh, go to www.elevate.vc to learn more about Elevate Capital, uh, www.first-insight.com for my company, First Insight. And then also an organization that I really do care about a lot, uh, which I help nurture and develop in Portland and also globally called, called Thai. So you could go to Thai.org or www.oregon.thai.org if you're in Oregon and learn more about Thai and uh, look at the good work those people are doing. There's about 2,000 of us who are volunteers, uh, successful entrepreneurs that give back in both our time and also capital. How do you spell Thai? T I E T Y E T I E T I E. Okay, good, folks. Thank you for listening to this episode. Um, find ways in your life to be centers of distribution, not centers of accumulation. You'll find that that model will just absolutely rock your world when you step into it. Center of distribution. You got a lot to give. Go go find ways to give it away. Okay, <laughs> and until next time, um, this is Blaine Bartlett. You've been listening to the Soul of Business with Blaine Bartlett. Nit and Rye, thank you so much for a fascinating interview. I've loved the thank time you. with us. Thank you. It was so, certainly a joy. Yeah, same here. Take care, my friend. Okay. Hi, I'd like to uh, ask you to do something for me, if you wouldn't mind. If you like this episode, I'd like you to uh, not only subscribe uh, on your favorite site, but I'd also like you to uh, give a rating. Uh, ideally, a, a five-star rating would be you know, greatly appreciated. But I think more importantly also would be just uh, some uh, comments. Uh, that helps with the algorithm and it helps build the, uh, the audience with this. And more than anything else, if you could um, invite somebody else to listen, just share this episode with a friend, with a colleague, and uh, I'd like to see how we can grow the soul of business. I think it makes a difference. Thanks.